Welcome to this week's episode of Lessons from the Cockpit. I am your host, Mark Hacera, and for over 60 years, my passion has been all things aviation. Special thanks to the book Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit, that is available in all four formats on Amazon, hardback, softback, Kindle, and on Audible. Flying has been described as long periods of boredom interrupted by short intermittent periods of extreme terror. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we debrief some of the most intriguing and fascinating pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. Our show investigates the tactics, techniques, and procedures these aviators created or cultivated during those extreme and extraordinary military, commercial, and private flying operations. By exploring their lessons learned, it gives our listeners practical advice on how does the aviation world work and develops critical thinking skills both in the air and on the ground. Many of these tactics, techniques, and procedures and their stories are being told here on Lessons from the Cockpit for the very first time. And on today's show, folks, you're going to hear one of those really fascinating stories. Because on today's show, folks, we're going to talk to a weapon system operator who flew during the Battle of Roberts Ridge in an F-15E Strike Eagle, call sign Twister 5-2. And he's going to give us his lessons learned from trying to save and recover a Navy SEAL team off of the top of Takargar Mountain in March of 2002. So, grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show with Colonel Chris Russell. Call sign Spliff. Spliff Russell, great to see you today and have you on the program. Hey, it's great to be here, Sluggo. It's uh, my pleasure to join you and uh, looking forward to our conversation today. Yeah, I am too. Man, you've got some incredible stories to tell. And why don't you just quickly tell everybody, this is who I am and this is what I was flying. This is my background. Yep. Chris Russell, go by Spliff. I was flying F-15Es in Afghanistan back in 2002. I just wrapped up 26 years in the Air Force, just retired last summer. I had an outstanding career, had a lot of fun, uh, a lot of great time uh, flying the F-15E and working with some great airmen and great soldiers and uh, sailors and Marines. Back in 2002, we were deployed uh, to Kuwait Air Base. We deployed there in January of 2002 and happened to be airborne uh, on 4 March 2002 when uh, some unfortunate incident uh, occurred on top of a high mountain in uh, Afga- eastern Afghanistan that led to uh, seven U.S. service personnel who were killed in action with just in uh, you know a matter of 24 hours. So, uh, But we happened to be there to p- provide some close air support to the troops on the ground that needed our help. Yeah, and so the run-up to that story obviously is, you know, what were you doing on 9-11? Because you're, you're a Wizzo in the Chiefs. On 9 11, yep. aren't you? Yeah, we were. I was stationed at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base in North Carolina. I was part of the 335th Fighter Squadron, so one of two operational squadrons at Seymour Johnson. On 9 11, I was actually at Squadron Officer School, uh, which is a leadership school for captains, right. you know, who've been in the Air Force for four to seven years. So we were doing right. some physical activities outside, and we all came back to the dorms to change to go into class. And, and that's when the, uh, the towers fell. The second aircraft had hit the, uh, the second tower, and shortly thereafter, the towers fell. So we were at Squadron Officer School, but uh, I returned back to my ops unit about two weeks later after Squadron Officer School was done and reported to my director of operations. He said, hey, welcome back. Hey, get ready, because uh, tomorrow you're doing an Operation Noble Eagle mission over our capital. You're going to be flying with live air-to-air missiles, and I need you to be prepared to prevent another 9-11 to occur and be prepared to shoot down an airliner if an airliner is hijacked. And so that was kind of my welcome back to the squadron shortly after 9-11. So he goes, hey, we've got a squadron room, a briefing room just down the hallway. It's got the spins for Operation Noble Eagle. I need you to get smart on those and go down that briefing room and you're going to study for the next couple hours. And then I need you to get out of here because you got an early, early go. And so I walked down to this to the briefing room that was set aside for the Noble Eagle missions and the, and the squadron had been flying for the last week or two. I walked in and up on the uh, our whiteboard was this silhouette of a 777, an airliner that somebody had sketched out with the marker pen. And on the left-hand side was basically the rules of engagement for potentially shooting down one of these airline, hijacked airliners. And it was step one, try to establish two-way communication. 
Step two, try to guide them and push them away from whatever uh, threat or whatever they may be pointing at. You know, step two, pop a flare across their nose. Step four, shoot an AIM-9 across the nose. Then it's, okay, now it's time to engage this aircraft. So shoot an AIM-9, you know, shoot two AMRAMs to take down a big aircraft, strafe the cockpit. So these are the kind of ROE, and this was completely... It was against everything, you know, that we grew up training for. We were supposed to be going after enemy, uh, behind enemy lines. And uh, now we're potentially shooting down innocent civilians who are hijacked. So that was kind of my welcome back to the squadron after 9-11. So that was certainly a wake-up call for, for all of us. And the emotions you must be going through thinking, I may have to shoot down a tube full of civilians. Yeah, absolutely. It was something completely unheard of. It was a bit shocking to read. We had to read through the special instructions and then walking out to your jet in North Carolina with live air to air AMRAMs and AIM 9s and then flying up. It was just a really somber, quiet flight up to Washington, D.C. We capped over yeah, the Pentagon um, and we had AWACS airborne up there. We had tankers there to give us gas and we did three hour vols. And it was just a, it was a really quiet mission, you know, because we just really did not want to see <laughs> see nine yeah. eleven happen again. So, so it was uh, certainly missions filled with emotions of hoping you did not have to get the call to uh, potentially run somebody down and try to go through that ROE. So, what did you and your pilot say to each other as you're walking out to the jet and you're like flying over the Pentagon? Because I know there's a lot of interaction in the cockpit. You know, I fly a crewed airplane too, and I remember flying some of these missions going. This is surreal. I hope this doesn't happen, but there's a lot of emotion in the cockpit too. Yeah, absolutely. And those are the exact same emotions we felt. None of us wanted to do that mission. None of us could believe that we were capping on over our nation's capital. It was surreal to think, what if I get the call? Certainly we would carry out the mission we were going to, but God, you just hope you never got that call. And thankfully, you know, we never had to do it. We had to intercept a couple, a couple of airplanes that weren't squawking, but thank God we never had to uh, shoot down a, an airliner. One of my bros on the West Coast spliff flies for the Griffins, and he was the second cap up over San Francisco. And really? He and his wingman are discussing the ROE while they're capping over SFO. Yeah. And they, <laughs> okay. I mean, think about this. They made a decision to fire at the same time at one target. So they neither one of them would have to live with the guilt of I squeezed the trigger on this because really? both of them were airline pilots and they realized wow. they might have to shoot down one of their bros. Wow. That's unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. He gets very emotional, obviously, when he talks about some of that stuff. So when you're flying Noble Eagle missions, the orders for you to deploy are coming down the pike here pretty soon. Yeah, I had uh, I had just started my instructor upgrade in the F-15E. I passed my first ride. My instructor at the time was a major Mark Kelly, who's now a uh, four-star Mark Kelly, who's the commander <laughs> of AFC. I passed my ride, and I'm reflecting on everything that I had done on the ride and kind of writing all the notes of everything he passed on to me. And my DO walks in. He knocks on the door. Hey, congratulations. You passed your first ride. Uh, we're going to put your instructor upgrade on hold. Uh, Cause we're going to war emotions of excitement. Hey, this is my first deployment. Oh my God, here we're going off to Afghanistan. He says, I need you to get ready. And oh, by the way, at the time, the F-15E did not have data link. We didn't have fighter data link, link mm -hmm. 16. This was something that went to the F-15C up in Mountain Home. And the Langley guys were supposed to get the next suite of mm -hmm. uh, link 16. So he goes, you and about eight other folks are going out to St. Louis to the Boeing factory you're going to learn about this Link 16 and fighter data link because we're going to take it in our jet. I need you to get smart on that. So then we started prepping for war. November, December, uh, we are getting ready to go to war. And then January, we deployed out to, uh, to Kuwait. So were you flying Southern Watch missions as well as Afghan missions at the same time? Yeah, we did. Uh, yep, we did OSW missions from Al Jaber in, in Kuwait. So, in fact, that was my first mission when I got into theater was a OSW mission. And we went into, into Iraq with two, two ship F-16s and offset container. And we were in the two ship strike Eagles and we were going off to, a, to make some noise in Southern Iraq. We also did DCA alert because Saddam Hussein used to do these, we call them the Baghdad to Basra runs. And he would, you know, it was an airliner that went twice a day, but some, every now and then he would tuck in a, a MiG-29 
mm-hmm. and resolution cell. So you, you, it was really difficult to see to see them. And so we would launch and do DCA alert. And then we we're also doing OEF missions uh, over to Afghanistan because we had no fighter airfields in Afghanistan at the time. There was no suitable airfields other than uh, C-17s, I think it's established. You know, they had nice. short field landings and C-130s to bring in equipment and fuel bladders and et cetera. But uh, so we were flying OEF missions, OSW. And then I, I from January to March, it was really quiet in Afghanistan. Because the Bold Tigers, the 391st, folks from the aircraft carrier, the F-18s and F-14s, they did a lot of great work toppling the Taliban and kind of attriting some of the Al-Qaeda that were in Afghanistan. You know, come January, it was pretty quiet. So January, February, we're doing OAF and really no taskings other than check in with the guys on the ground, see if they need anything, make some noise. But it wasn't until Operation Anaconda in early March that uh, that things start to, to heat up a bit. And you know what? Everybody got surprised by that. Everybody. General Mosley was out on a trip. General Corley sees this 110 page brief that comes across his desk. The army guy that was there, I can't remember his name. I I could picture him though in an instant says in a meeting, there's something big coming. It's army and it's named after a snake. That was our first (laughs) introduction to Anaconda. Yeah. And then we get the ATO or the, the requirements like five days prior. And we're all like going, wait a minute, this isn't anything like what we were told. And we're jumping through hoops like crazy spliff to try and catch up. And they had a blizzard down there for like two days and it gave us two days to get ready. And as you know, when it kicks off, it goes to hell quick. We knew even less in the squadron level. I mean, there was two crews, two pilots, two whizzos that were going to be part of the initial D-Day uh, of the initial targets that you guys produced mm-hmm. in the KOC. Um, this particular crew was sequestered, sequestered, and nobody knew what they were doing. They were up to something secret, and they were planning the uh, the first use of the GB twenty four thermobaric weapon that was used to to find people in caves and overpressurize the caves. They had I forgot tested. about that. Yeah, so they, we didn't know about it until after after the mission was done, and. We asked them, like, what are you guys doing? Because they were off in their own little bubble, and they're really secretive about it. And this was the initial crew. A couple of weapons officers and some of our experienced guys were off uh, getting whatever data they could get from the uh, from you guys at the KAOC to support the, to support night one. And so th- that thermobaric weapon had gone through testing out of Nellis for the, about the month leading up to it. As we know, it's been quiet. We know the guys after Tora Bora had mm-hmm. disappeared in the caves, and so we yeah, need a weapon yeah. to skip skip into the caves and so they they loaded up the first thermobaric weapon and and, de- and employed that that first night and that's a, that's a whole nother story because it didn't it didn't go well uh but so they were off doing that and then uh, we learned i learned about anaconda literally the three marks when i showed up for my mission brief to take off at midnight on you know early morning of four uh four march i had no idea what anaconda was our army liaison officer the ground liaison officer stand you know intel briefs what's the threat picture then the army uh, liaison officer stands up and goes, yeah, there's, there's something, you know, the army's 101st airborne 10th mountain. They're over in Eastern Afghanistan and uh, they've entered the fight and uh, you may or may not deal with them when you go out there, but here's a list of frequencies. And uh, it was literally a five minute, maybe brief on the scheme of maneuver, what they were doing. So, I mean, SA was very low on what was going on for Anaconda yeah, down at the squadron level. Oh, I, I can only imagine. Cause if we were scrambling at the chaos, at the same yeah. time, trying to figure out what's going on, we're watching predator porn. That's all I can call it. You know, yeah. we're just watching things happen, but we're hearing stuff going bad because boss man, the AWACS is in the background and we can hear the octaves up. It was a mess. So you take off at midnight to head down there. It's a three hour flight down. I know it's a long ways down there too. So yeah. You and Panzer must be talking back and forth with your pilot about, okay, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You know, what was you know, that, that like? Point, you know, we have done, so yeah, we took off at midnight Kuwait time, which is about three in the morning, Afghanistan. And that's mm-hmm. about when Petty Officer Deal Roberts falls out of the, uh, or slips out of the back of the Chinook. And so it was pretty quiet going down because we had been doing this mission for two months. We just thought it was a normal, another OEF mission. We got a long day ahead of us. These are 10 to 12 hour missions. You know, it's pretty quiet when you're going to and from the AOR. So, we, you know, we, 
multiple refuelings to get there. We meet up with the KC 10s or KC 135s somewhere over United Arab Emirates. Uh, get another top off if you're going through the driveway or the boulevard up through Pakistan and then you, you enter Afghanistan. So yeah, it's, it's a three, three and a half hour drone. And we're just talking about things to keep ourselves awake. <laughs> hey, did you catch the uh, NFL playoffs? They're talking about life and family, just kind of keep it, keeping it going. So most of the time it's just concentrating on, on flying and getting in and safe, you know, getting our gas. Uh, and you have no so we, idea what's about to happen to you. We have no idea what's going on. And we show up probably just, uh, just before sunrise, maybe five, six in the morning. And the sun is just coming up. Um, when we check into the AOR. So are you guys flying with night vision goggles at this time? Or are you strictly, uh, leaning on your targeting pods and stuff? So we have night vision goggles for this deployment. Okay. We had just gotten the night vision goggles. We had just gotten uh, Link 16. So Fighter Data Link mm-hmm. uh, was up and running, which provided enormous amounts of SA because you could, that Fighter Data Link gave you how much that shows you where the tankers are, which yeah. is an important, that's yeah. like number one. Number two, you can see how much fuel other F-15s have, what kind of weapons, um, how many weapons they've yeah. dropped, what frequency yeah. they're on, what JTAC they're talking to. So uh, we had night vision goggles at the time, which uh, provided uh, enormous amounts of SA if the moon, moon, if the environmentals supported yeah. it. Sunrise, you're yep. seeing shadows, yeah, you're seeing light, off. you're seeing shadows. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we, those quickly dawn and we don't, we didn't wear them to and from the AOR because yeah. they just, I mean, if you're wearing it for 10 hours, it just creates a lot of <laughs> yeah, strain man. on the neck. So we need them when we, we need them. Remind me to, I'll tell you a story about, we almost hit an AC-130 in the middle middle of the night wearing EVGs on a previous in January. So I can tell that story now or later, but <laughs> yeah, now nah, go ahead and tell it now. So uh, you asked a question about where we're wearing EVGs. This is in uh, January, February timeframe. I was flying with a different uh, pilot, not Panzer at the time, uh, routine mission, middle of the night. And we were in trail of a tanker, about two mile trail, waiting for some F-16s to get their gas. Once they float off, we mm-hmm. would pull up to the tanker and get gas. Well, I lock. I have the radar at the time. I'm running the air to air radar, and I lock a contact about ten miles off our nose, about right to right one o'clock. And he's within about thousand feet to five hundred feet of us. And I call out the traffic to everybody. Tanker acknowledges the guys uh, yeah. in the case one thirty five flight lead uh, acknowledges. I'm monitoring this guy coming down, and I had taken off my MVGs at the time. Yeah. And we we tell the front seater, hey, my my nogs are off. My MVGs are off. Okay, copy. And so that lets the other person know whether or not they can see better at night or not. And I asked him, he gets within five nautical miles as contact, and the altitude is climbing toward our altitude, co-altitude. He's within about 200 feet of us. He's at four miles, now three miles. And I said, do you got him? Because I thought his MVGs were still on. And he goes, yep, I got him. So I thought he was visual with him and under the MBGs. What he meant was I got him on the radar because he's flying formation off of our flight lead. So a little bit of miscommunication there, confusion in the cockpit. Okay, great. Well, he comes inside of a mile. I call out another traffic call. Nobody can see him. There's no lights. There's no beacons. There's no flashing lights. And so I call out the contact again about two miles. About a mile out, I see the silhouette of a C-130 lights out. Oh, no. I grab the control stick and I pull back on the stick as the AC-130 goes right underneath us. And it was so close. We heard the, the engines whoosh right underneath. Our oh aircraft. no. And we heard it. And I still have a vivid flash of four propellers. I mean, the big sky theory we talk about, Hey, there's lots of sky out there. You're probably not going to hit anything. And here we are in the middle of, <laughs> in the middle of the night. And neither one of us are wearing our MBGs and we almost smacked and, and caused a mid-air collision. So, I mean, the lesson learned is there be, be very clear and concise with the communication mm-hmm. within your cockpit, just like you did as a, as a crew dog yeah. and making sure that everybody is on the same page. And if there is a little bit of doubt, you ask a question again, uh, that scared us both that night. Yeah. Well, so we ride. Yeah. We, we packed a lot of airplanes into that airspace over Shaikut Valley. Yep. And that was yeah. one of the things all of us were worried about. Who's going to run into who? Who's going to bump into who? And yeah. I'm sure you're going to talk about the predator problems and all the other things that happen. Now you arrive at basically sunup over the Shaikut Valley. How are you first contacted about troops in contact somewhere in Afghanistan? So initially, when we check in, we have no idea that a helicopter has been shot down. There's this whole thing going on on Roberts Ridge at Takargar. The first people we get told to contact is uh, Texas 1-4, which is an Army SF team, an ODA team that is working 
on the Whaleback Mountain. So on the, the west side of Shawikot Valley, there's a ridge line that a lot of folks know about if you've read about Anaconda, but it kind I of remember it well. Yeah, blocks the western side of Shawikot Valley. So we check in with Texas 1 4 and hey, hey, we got a couple targets for you. We have some observation points that we think there's some enemy at. We need you guys to uh, employ a couple GB 12s, which is a 500 pound laser guided weapon. Quickly, it got exciting because we had not done anything for two two months. This is going to be my first combat drop. We actually work a couple of targets on the Whaleback Mountain with Texas 1-4, employ a couple GB-12s. Then the first time we make contact with any of the task force that are on that mountain, uh, we get pushed to MAKO 3-0, which is the, the initial team that inserted yeah. the Officer Roberts. Later, that had Tech Sergeant John Chapman, who received mm-hmm. the uh, Air Force, or sorry, the Medal of Honor. Uh, so we check in with Mako 30, and this is when the adrenaline started to pump because Mako 30, they said, Hey, we are on the run. We've got one KIA, we've got several injured, and we need some help. Uh, they were actually had already gone down from the mountain, the initial uh, yeah. mountain that they got um, dropped off that. They were working their way back down the mountain because it was there was too many enemy on top of that mountain. And so they gave us a target and they passed it off to our flight lead. They hit one target. Unfortunately, there was some uh, some coordinate error in that GB-12, so it went off on a mountain that was about a kilometer away. So so that was Mako 3-0. And then as he is finishing employing that weapon, we get a coordinates and a frequency to contact uh, some folks on top of a mountain. So I throw my targeting pod on top of this mountain, and I see a Chinook's blades in wind-down mode. Oh, and I no. see some people coming down, and we have – we're not in communication with them at the time. I have we have no idea that they just took an RPG and four KIA almost immediately after they uh, crash landed. And so we see these uh, Chinook blades winding down, and we're like, okay, this, these must be the guys that we're going to help talk to. And finally, after a couple minutes, we get on frequency with Slick Zero One, who becomes the ETAC that uh, enlisted terminal air controller that we end up talking to for the next six hours of our lives. So that was kind of our introduction into getting to the to the folks on top of the mountain. If I remember right, close air support was not in your doctrine or had just showed up in your doctrine. You hadn't shot a gun at a ground target or any of this stuff. Yeah, that's an important point, uh, Sluggo. The F-15E, no F-15E unit had cast in their doc, doc statement. Our focus up to this deployment was everything that the Strike Eagle was built for, long range, interdiction strike, Combining the missions of the old F-111, the F-4, the F-15C, put that all into a strike eagle, and that was our focus. So our doctrine statement at the time was defensive counter air, protecting high valued mm-hmm. assets like anchors and AWACS and U-2s, et cetera. The previous red flag we went to, we first got the MBGs, and also they added offensive counter air to our doc statement. Mm-hmm. See, no other F-15E unit had offensive counter air, so our focus was on air to air. That red flag had no F-15Cs at the time because we were going to be the OCA yeah. squadron there. And so we were focused on, you know, how to do, you know, fighter escort and sweep. We had a nuclear mission at the time at Seymour mm-hmm. Johnson. So all the certifications, verifications, which takes up a lot of time in your squadron to make sure that you're, you know, you're ready to execute the nation's number one yep. mission. So close air support was nowhere in our doc statement. It certainly was after this, uh, after four March. And then you said, using the gun to hit targets on the ground, the F-15E gun and the F-15C gun, you know, they're made for air to air. The gun is canted two degrees up so that when you're in a dog fight, the gun is pulling just a little bit of lead. If you've ever done skeet shooting or shot at anything, you know, you need to pull lead. Well, they built the F-15E gun to help pull lead in that air to air dog fight. You know, we had done air to ground bombing, obviously, because that was kind of our bread and butter, but the sight picture to drop a dumb bomb or LGB is completely different than, strafing at the target you've got to put the velocity vector well before below the target if you're on a 30 degree dive or a 25 degree dive which is opposite of dumb bombing pointing the jet at the ground to employ the uh, gun something we had never done before and the first time we're doing it is in combat on 4 march 2002 so it's certainly a, an eye-opening experience and you're laying bullets down 80 to 100 meters from the good guys danger yeah, close so this, for the first yeah. time yeah, so danger close means, uh, for the folks that don't know, is friendly and enemy forces are within one kilometer of each other. And a lot of the weapons that we employ, if you drop a 500-pound weapon, fragmentation from those bombs are going to take out a lot of people in that fragmentation area. 
yeah, we are employing within 75 meters. In fact, some of the guys moved up to 50 meters from the bunker and we're trying to shoot the gun. And so when you're coming down the chute and you look at the, the gun pipper, the helicopter is right on the edge where we're trying to uh, lay down bullets. And so it's very, very dangerous. Both the pilots who did the strafing did an outstanding job because it obviously uh, the risk was quite high. And it was the first time any anybody had done emergency cast, I think, since Vietnam War. So at least in the conventional air force. I didn't know that. Yeah. I don't know about the the gunship and and, and some of the special op missions that go around the world, but I don't believe it happened in a desert storm. Uh, But I had heard that this is the first time we had done some sort of ECAS like that in a long time. So, and you can see the helicopter on the mountain in the video. Yeah. The, the talk on took all of about 30 seconds. We queued up, we see a helicopter, see the clump of trees at the 12 o'clock position off the nose. That's where the enemy is. I need you to lay down fire there. So, And that must have been something crazy going through your head. I've never done this before, never done this before. And now I'm laying down bullets. But you're saying to yourself at the same time, I'm protecting my guys. I'm going to do whatever I can, whatever it takes, whatever it Absolutely. takes. Absolutely. I mean, that that's that's the bread and butter supporting the guys on the ground. And yeah. that's where wars are won. So absolutely doing everything that we could to uh, to suppress the enemy. So those guys could uh, live a couple more hours and get off that mountain. What happens as you're doing this? I mean, you're there for a while. So you're rotating off tankers. You're going back and forth into the battle. Yeah, there there was. You know, this is where the lessons come in um, in some of the, the C2 structure that was in place. You had the special ops world was on a completely different chain of command, operating on different frequencies. You had a CIA predator in the uh, area that was on its own frequency in our cast wheel. You had an EP3 that was trying to collect information on the battlefield that was in our cast wheel. Multiple frequencies out there, and we had no no FAC A, we had no A-10s in theater. So the AWACS, who is not trained to do the work of what an ASOC should do or um, what an A-10 should do, they're trying to manage the tankers that are communicating with you guys back in the chaos. Mm-hmm. They're trying to flow in assets. We It was really, really fr- frustrating. You talk about the fog and friction of war. I mean, it was happening all in that valley. The valley was only about five miles by three miles wide and, and long. He had a lot of folks in that airspace trying to help out this fight that was going on. And uh, it was really challenging. It was frustrating because we would be talking to the guys on top of the mountain. And then we would get told, hey, clear off because there's some B-52s that want to lay down bombs (laughs) in the valley, which is only a couple miles away. So we would get told to hold either east or west uh, and we'll call you back in. And so when we're checking out, you know, the guys that we're talking to on the ground, like, where are you guys going? get back here. We need you. Well, sorry. We're, you know, uh, we're being told to, to get out of the way because B-52s are going to load it, um, um, lay down some fire. Yeah. I mean, we would spend 30, 45 minutes. All right, well, let's go get some gas and then come back. Hey, stand by. That predator wants to shoot a hellfire at the bunker. Then they don't get cleared because the danger close situation. They later do. Um, they later get cleared uh, later on in the day, but there was massive confusion um, it was really frustrating in the airplane, knowing that those guys are on the ground getting shot at. We've got weapons on board. The guys were pedaling hard everywhere, trying to do what's right. Yeah. It just, yeah. It's just the kind of the structure we went into that fight was just not quite ready to handle that. And they later squared it away, but uh, it took a few days. So I got to see the General Mosley's brief to General Hornberg after the fight. One of his uh, commander's action group guys came up to me and guess what was lesson learned? Number one, command structure. The AFSOC guys were actually getting their orders from Masira and Oman, right? people there on Oman. Yeah. And there was just a whole bunch of errors that happened because Mako 30 wasn't the original team that was supposed to go up there. Right. It was Blaber's team from Delta Force who had done all of this mission planning, all of this preparation, and then we're told at the last minute, SEALs are taking this one. Yeah. And that led to a lot of things, too. And we had airplanes stacked up above you to include, for the first time, the E-8 Joint Stars that was down there, call sign Stiletto, plus the tankers, 
AWACS, everything, like you mentioned, one of my dearest friends was a director in the crow's nest at the Kayak. And I remember him telling me, F-18 Hornet guy, <laughs> I'm not trained to do any of this stuff. I'm not a battle manager. And he says he's, you know, pulling things out of every orifice. And fortunately, we had a lot of very highly trained people that were able to put all this together. And I think that was also the night that we sent A-10s down. I think that's when Soup Campbell and K-9 were actually coming down. They get there like in the afternoon, if I remember right. We passed them on the way down. On the way home, we passed them as they were going to, uh, I think, Pakistan uh, was their initial location. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just a very crazy time listening to it on the radios. So finally, you guys are like in the middle of this fight and you're like cleared off, aren't you? You're told like, go home. Yeah, we're told, hey, your vol time is done. Uh, we've got some F-16s that are coming to replace you. And, and they were two F-16s from the same base that we had come in, come into. We each had, we had expended all of our rounds of our gun or 20 millimeter. Mm -hmm. So we had done probably five or six passes each. And so we were told to go home. Well, each of us had a couple of GB 12s um, left on station. So we, we go to the tanker, we, we fill up and we start coordinating, you know, through boss man. Hey, we've got some more weapons. There's guys on the ground. And so we kind of push to get back in the fight. But F 16s also did some good work because they employed the gun. Mm -hmm. I, I believe the, uh, the flight lead, Divot, who's the squadron commander, um, actually did the strafing. And then I think they both, at least one of them dropped GB-12. They, they dropped right. the first 500 because the enemy was reinforcing. They were coming up the mountains and the guys up on top of the, the Americans that were up on top of the mountain were, were slowly being overwhelmed. And so it, it got so bad up there that they finally came up with a plan. The JTAC, the ETACs up on, on top of the mountain mm -hmm. said, hey, we've got to lay down some heavier ordnance. Yeah. And so they figured out a plan of how to hide behind, you know, rocks, what attack access to use that would hopefully minimize the rock and the fragmentation coming off the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, off the, uh, the bunker in the, in the mountain there. So yeah, the, the two ship F 16s laid down the, a couple bombs, but they, they were only carrying, I think two or four a piece. And so they, they, I don't think the, the wingman uh, dropped GB 12s on that one, but so they, they did a couple hours of just going on into the target, get kicked off for other various reasons. And we, we stayed with the tanker and kind of held outside the target area, hoping mm -hmm. that someone would call us back in. And thankfully, the two ship of F-16s made their way back to Kuwait. So they came in to replace us. And they actually landed before we got home because we stayed on for a couple more hours because we still had bombs. Right. And we, we wanted to still help help those guys. And w the next time we checked back in with them uh, is when we got clearance to drop uh, GB 12s and somewhere in there, our flight leads radio failed. <laughs> and so we, we took the tactical lead and worked with a JTAC, got the talk on to, um, and so in our two ship, I was the first to, uh, me and Panzer were the first to release the, uh, our GB 12. And I, I was really concerned because it's about 200, anything inside of 200 meters with a GB 12, it's very dangerous. I mean, high likelihood that if you're inside that circle, you're probably going to get hit by something. You, you may not die, but you get hit. It's going to hurt. hurt. <laughs> I said, all right, well, let's, the way the mountain was constructed, you had our helicopter and the guys fighting on, on the, uh, the west side, the bunker and where the enemy was occupying was up on top of the mountain. And, and we knew they were being reinforced on the east side of the mountain. So I said, well, why don't we use the shape of the mountain? to help uh, reduce the amount of fragmentation that was going to go over to the, uh, the helicopter side. Although I could see the, uh, the bunker and the trees, I didn't want to put a bomb right on that one because although the GB 12 is a very accurate weapon um, at times, and we've seen it, some of our weapon weapon system evaluation program, WESA, sometimes you get a fin failure. Sometimes when you're lasing and the laser energy bounces off a rock and hits some other object, the GB-12 will see that object and go toward that with the last known uh, laser spot. And so sometimes there's a little bit of jitter in our laser. So you could, there, there is some error that could, could happen, even though it's a very accurate weapon. I was a little hesitant to laser right on the target. So I picked a, a spot, of, you know, 100, 200 meters down and say, hey, let's, let's walk our bombs closer to make sure we don't kill our folks. So, uh, so that's what we did with the remaining GB-12s. We orchestrated the last remaining GB-12s uh, until we kind of worked our way up, up to the bunker. Have you met any of those guys on the ground? Yes, a couple. Uh, first one was Staff Sergeant Vance. So he, he was a Silver Star uh, recipient from that mission. He was an ETAC at the time, uh, enlisted terminal air controller. Now he was Slick 01, right? He was Slick 01. 
And he was the, he was the guy that we should have been talking to because he was the guy who was qualified to how to employ air power, but he was busy holding down the enemy. And so we asked uh, Gabe Brown, who did an amazing job. It was the guy who we talked to was another combat controller on the ground. Uh, so we mostly talked with Sergeant Brown. But Vance was giving Brown some direction to kind of help orchestrate the talk on and the and our attacks. And so we later met Sergeant Vance. He was part of the 75th Ranger Regiment out at Fort Bragg. We invited him up to uh, North Carolina after we got done with our deployment. <laughs> and uh, he told his story, his perspective from the ground, which, I mean, he had the whole audience, our whole squadron captivated to his story of just bravery and sure warrior at ethos. Uh, and then we told our our side of the story. We introduced him to Jeremiah Weed, which he loved. <laughs> so we had a good day in the bar. But you know what was funny was he goes, hey, guys, um, I never told you this, but you were getting shot at. And we're like, shot at with what? He goes, as you guys were doing your strafing runs with the gun, they were shooting RPGs up at you. And they were going off all around your airplane. And we're like, what? How come you didn't tell us that? And we're like, well, we didn't want you to go away. <laughs> so, <laughs> like, All right. Well, fair enough. That makes sense. Got been shot at. So, yeah, we had no idea. None of us saw these RPGs that were potentially going off around. And they probably were going off just underneath us. But um, pretty funny story now that we were, you know, after the fact, and getting hit, did not get hit by any of them. Isn't that crazy that you learn things? And what's this years later from a completely different viewpoint? that you had no idea what was going on. Okay. No, idea. like the RPGs listening to his perspective, it must've been spellbinding because he's getting shot at. He's trying to orchestrate all of this. He's got guys that are already dead that didn't even make it off of the ramp of that helicopter. Uh, and yeah. Sergeant Vance. Oh man. That must. Yeah. Be he was uh, the next state of the union address by uh, Bush 43. Vance was up in the audience and, and Bush recognized him and standing ovation for his actions. Yeah. Uh, he, I think he won a second solar star for a couple of years later for more ass kicking in, in Afghanistan. <laughs> so, what, what, oh, what, what, uh, I tell you, I, I met one other gentleman. He was the pilot of the Chinook in the front right seat. He was flying when the RPG slammed into that Chinook that we were providing support to. I met him at um, Virginia Tech. He, uh, he, he's part of the faculty there, works on Virginia Tech, but he was a chief warrant officer, part of the mm -hmm. 160th Special Ops Aviation Regiment. Best helicopter unit in the world. It is. Those guys are unbelievable. And so he, he came and listened to, I was briefing some of the Air Force ROTC cadets out of Virginia Tech a couple mm -hmm. of years ago. I did two sessions, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And in the morning session, the Army ROTC detachment commander listened and in my morning session, he goes, I need you to meet somebody. And that afternoon, in walks this guy, Ron Calvert, who was the uh, chief warrant officer. And he's like, yeah, I was I was flying uh, Slick 01 or Razor 01 uh, that day. And uh, I was the one who got shot. And so he's telling this story about getting hit by the RPG. He took 11 rounds as he was hovering and trying to crash land. Nine of them hit his Kevlar vest and two of them hit him uh, outside of his Kevlar vest. And so he had bullet holes uh, in him. And so he's telling this story. And I'm I am just in awe. I'm like, I can't believe I'm meeting a pilot and his story. And so he kind of tells his story of what happened up on top of the mountain. And he, he was starting to lose a lot of blood. And one of the uh, PJs there, pararescuemen at MedTech's uh, senior airman, Jason Cunningham, who mm -hmm. um, was killed on that mountain. He's the one that saved this guy, Ron Calvert's life. And he was off the, a couple hours later, he had made his way, the, the pilot had made his way back off the ramp and kind of shielding himself from the enemy fire. Uh, and Jason Cunningham was tending to his injuries when Jason Cunningham took a shot just underneath in the in the femoral artery. And that's the the hit that that eventually um, he, he bled out. Uh, but he was there when, when Cunningham was saving his life. And so incredible story, both on Jason Cunningham and, and uh, this chief warrant officer's pilot oh, skills dude. to crash land. I mean, he, he was running out of I mean, crash landing on top of that that mountain, taking a, getting shot at as well. So uh, unbelievable. Well, and the video shows parts of the air of the vehicle yeah. flying through the air. Yeah. Okay. When yep. they get hit by the RPG. Right. Yeah. And, and brother, I was watching that from the chaos. And I remember everybody going, Oh, as the helicopter gets hit and we see the guys coming off the back, those four guys mm -hmm. drop. We're like going, Oh crap. This just went, this just got even more confusing. 
Yeah, he told me that his talk, his operation center, he had popped the jet. They they can jettison their windows. Yeah, and it had popped out. Well, from the video, they thought he was dead for a long time because they just it looked like maybe a body slumping over. Mm-hmm. And so they were kind of doing tally. Well, how many people when we do get up there to rescue them? How many KIA do we have? And they they basically had written them off until later on. They're like, oh, we thought you were dead, you know. But thankfully, he uh, survived. So. Yeah, there's a lot you can glean from Predator video, but obviously some of the details, you know, it helps to have a human on the ground for sure. Well, yeah, and and having Kevin Vance tell you, hey, did you know you're getting shot at? You know, <laughs> yeah, that's right. and, and you're like, what? You yeah. Know, exactly. What? Yeah. So now you're out of bombs, out of rounds, and you finally go home. Yeah, right? we, we had told, fought to stay longer, but finally boss man passed us, hey, chariot direction, you go home now. And that, that means the three star says, get your butt home. <laughs> yeah. And then when I read your book, uh, Tanker Pilot, and how much gas and how much we were screwing up your tanker plan, <laughs> it was, I'm glad we, I mean, we were out of every, out of everything. There wasn't much we could do other than make noise, which is, is useful, but we were starting to get replenished by F-18s and F-14s mm-hmm. off the carrier. Um, and so th- there was, there was plenty of firepower with munitions. And so. It was time for us to go home. You know, we had stayed our, we could do all that we we were able to do. And so we faced a four hour drone home, you know, back against the jet stream, back to, uh, to, back to Al Jabber. So I got a phone call from the KC-10 commander at Al Dafra. Great guy, Phil uh, Iannuzzi. We call him Snooze. And Snooze was going, Sluggo, you just put a big dent in my schedule, everything like that. You know, and I'm going, Snooze? be prepared for more abuse. Things are going to hell down there. You're not seeing what I'm seeing. Yeah. You're not, you're not involved with what's going on. Well, what's going on? He said, and I told him a helicopter's down and there's a lot of guys dead right now. And he just goes, well, you know, it's really messing with my schedule and everything like that. And I said, stand by for more abuse. Yeah. Because your airplane can refuel boom and drogue receivers at the same time with the same tanker, we're going to put a lot more gas in you. And I think that tanker ended up flying a 15.1 or something crazy. Really? Oh yeah. They were down there for a long time. Yeah. Which generated the phone call. And I just said, look, this is the way it is for right now until we get things under control down there, expect us to be putting more gas in you guys, they call it consolidating and they hate that because they know they're going to be around for a while. Be there for a while. But you know what? They said once he understood what was going on, he was go, oh, didn't know that. Got it. We're we're on top of this. Like you said, you didn't know you're being shot at. He didn't know what was going on in the battlefield. Sure. He was just like yeah, going, yeah. crap, my schedule is all screwed up. Where are these guys? How come they haven't come back yet? Having to explain to him there's seven Americans dead right now in one battle. And it was like, yeah. got it, Sluggo. Got it. Yeah. Isn't it amazing how everybody will come together? In a battle like that, there's two Medal of Honor winners, numerous silver stars, bronze stars, all in a 17-hour time frame from this one battle over Takargar. Yeah, it's it's a story of bravery. Yeah. It's about helping the person you're fighting with, you know, on your left and right, doing whatever it takes to uh, to help those guys out. Absolutely. It was remarkable. And innovation on the fly. Yeah. Yeah. Having to do things for the very first time that you've never done before. And you're just like going, okay, junior being an A-10 pilot, he probably can figure out, okay, he was, and to all my listeners, he was flying in Twister 5-1. So he's, he's at least shot a gun at the ground. Yeah, we could gun. have for a better flight lead at the time to do the first cast in the F-15E as a guy who, you know, grew up flying the A-10, at least one assignment prior to that. He had experience in Allied Force. You got a DFC and Allied Force, you know, employing the A-10 in, in the gun as well. So the stars were aligned to make that he was leading our two ship. It was yeah. really helpful. And he had an experienced Wizzo in his backseat, a lieutenant colonel who previous 111 guys. So we we had the right guys in, uh, in Twister 5-1 for sure. As that amazing too. So what do you and Panzer talk about on the way home after something so emotional? Your adrenaline going up and down. And what are you guys talking about in the cockpit on the way home? I think the the overwhelming emotion was frustration at first. I, I think we were really frustrated that we couldn't do more. That there was it took us so long 
I mean, we're getting kicked off the target area, back to the target area, kicked off the target area, back. So there was that emotion. There was, you know, the second one is, wow, we've never dropped in combat. And here we are, Winchester, going back home with no. <laughs> we, we were carrying nine GB12s at the time and 500 rounds of uh, 20 Mike Mike. And we had employed all that. And we had two, four missiles, two MRAMs and M9s that we were carrying back. But to be Winchester, air to ground, you know, in our first combat drop was not something that you had, we had seen in a while. So we had that. We had fatigue. Certainly we were tired. We were exhausted because just, you know, combat, it, it's not pales in comparison to what was going on in the mountain. As we're flying home, knowing that they are still on top of that mountain, you know, but certainly you know, it was a long mission. It was 12 and a half hours, 12.3 hours, I think is what it was. Uh, we had eight re- air refueling. So there, there was quite a lot going on. So there, there was a little bit tired, but our exhaustion was the least of our worries at that time. It, yeah. was, it was really focused on how we've got to tell people when we get back kind of what happened so we can quickly help those guys out. But Well, I'm sure that you had a crowd around your videotape while you guys were debriefing, looking at all this stuff. We, we there, did. There's it, the it, helicopter. It, there's the helicopter. Initially, it was just a, a few folks. But then as the story came out, absolutely, when we came back, because folks had gotten the news from the chaos before we landed, like some folks had seen the Predator video, our LNO was watching the same predator video video that mm-hmm. you saw in the chaos. We talked to him on the phone. He saw, you know, Roberts, you know, have his last minutes on top of that mountain. It was, it was pretty gruesome. So we heard about that and we spent several hours with Intel debriefing, watching our videos and then getting documenting that out so we could send it off to the chaos and the leadership to, to figure out what kind of help we need. And, and we talked to the, uh, the vice group commander, El Cid, who was an A-10 pilot there. And he, he's great the American, great he is, American. Yep. He Matt is new and uh, swander. He's outstanding. He, and he is still, it, it's been a few years since I've talked to him, but you know, he retired. He was an ASOG group commander, but he retired. Uh, I won't say where he's at just in case, but he is still very much involved in, in sharing those lessons and making mm-hmm. sure that the air component and the ground component uh, work well together and all the integration, the technology, the tactics, techniques, and procedures. He's the great American. He grows. And so he, he wrote a really good article about that too. Yeah. He's, he's, he's right out there. That's got it written about that. And he later forward deployed with the A-10. In fact, we were airborne two nights later, me and Pans are on six March on our next mission. And El Cid is out there in his A-10 and we have our link 16. And so we can see him. He didn't have link 16. And he's asking for help from boss man about something. We just pipe over like, hey, he's left 10 o'clock. Where's the, where's the tanker kind of thing? A couple yeah. of these point out. He's like, God, I wish I had that much essay. Thank you, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so he, he was he was awesome to work with and, and certainly helped get the A-10s into the fight. And after a couple of days, once the A-10 showed up and all you guys at the KOC, it really started to smooth over. We had FAC A there. We had folks controlling who was in and out of the airspace, and it worked much better the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. So I tell you, on that, on that, two days later, six March. So Panzer and I are back, back in the action. Six March, the landscape had changed. If you recall, I know you know this, but everybody thought the enemy was in that valley, and they had escaped east toward Pakistan. And so, so the main target areas were the they call them rat lines. You know yep. the. the the trails that led into Pakistan is where they were fleeing to. So those became our focus areas. And so we had changed our, our weapons load out to a uh, general purpose air burst weapons and cluster munitions back when they were legal to drop. And we were looking for those targets. And at the end, um, I will never forget this at the end, at, when we checked in, they said, Hey, if we don't task you in the next three hours, we want you to ripple your Mark 80, your, uh, your dumb bombs on this particular target and then head home. Okay, got it. So three hours it happens. We don't get a tasking. We check back in with boss man. And they said, yep, you're still clear to hit that target. Uh, clear to ripple your, you know, 12 mark 80. Or I think it was, I think we had three. We had GB12s. We had pretty mixed configuration. So it was three for us and three GB mark 82s from our wingman. So we turn final. This is a night delivery. We're about ready to release. We're about 15 seconds from release. I find the target and it's just a, basically a rat line of where we think the enemy might be um, moving in and out. And about five seconds prior to release, up on the Link 16 pops this helicopter symbol, a friendly helicopter, a green symbol on our, our display, which tells us it's a friendly helicopter. I roll my cursors to it. It says CH-47 or MH-47, which is a Chinook. And I go, stand by, Panzer, do not drop, do not drop. 
and the and the helicopter flies right through the target area where we were about ready to drop. Oh weapons. my gosh! We, we, thank God for Link Sixteen. Thank you for her developed this uh, system because it potentially prevented a fratricide. And so we go weapon safe. We come back around. Uh, we notify boss man. We're like, hey, you told us there were no friendlies in the area. And they're like, yeah, we didn't think anybody was down there. You know, we'll we'll check it out. <laughs> and so it's still a little bit of you know calm, calm issues. And, and it was hard communication in those valleys is really tough. You know, you had to have line of sight. We didn't have bacon there at the time. So we didn't have that airborne kind of radio system flying around yet. So, so not everybody was talking on the same frequency. And if they were, then maybe the mountains got in the way anyway. So we rolled back a while and then dropped our weapons and then headed home and hit the target. But uh, yeah, it was, thank God that link 16, I think potentially saved us from a really bad incident that night. Isn't that crazy? That one little, that one little system that you have and yeah. how much situational awareness. Yeah, it was huge. Because I think about think about what had happened if that helicopter had waited six seconds to take off. Yep. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it would been a bad, bad day. <clears throat> For the audience, Bacon is an airplane that has a uh, like a radio relay in it that we use over Afghanistan later. And that was a big game changer for everybody because again, you can't talk through these mountains. People don't realize these are 19,000 foot peaks that we're battling on, you know, 12, Mm -hmm. 16, 19,000 foot. And you've got people in the canyons who can't talk to each other. Remember Marcus Luttrell and his group that are going in on Operation Red Wing are having the same communication problems. And Murph goes out with his phone, with his radio on top of a, a rock, exposes himself, gets shot just so he can get off a phone call to say, we're in trouble. Yes. Here's are at. So how many more missions did you fly during Anaconda? You flew the fourth or sixth? Did you have, cause it went on for like, like no, another week more. I, think I, uh, I don't think I flew any more during Anaconda. It was more about getting other folks some combat experience because we, we were at the time we were only doing three or four month deployments. And so we were supposed to be going home at the end of March. And so they wanted to get other folks in the squadron, some combat experience. And so mm-hmm. we had the capacity to do that. So, I was also going through my instructor upgrade during the time. <laughs> I, I'm well, you're deployed. Instructor. Yeah, which is pretty rare, but it was so slow in that January, February time. So, no, I, I did not fly any more Anaconda missions. I maybe flew one or two more after Anaconda was done and nothing certainly is significant. I didn't drop any more during that deployment. So it was just those two missions. So, And things were uh, pretty boring over Iraq at the same time, too, weren't they? Yeah, it was still OSW. Not much going on. However, lots of planning in the chaos at the time. Because I remember um, Mark Kelly, I was talking about General Kelly now, came back and said, oh, by the way, get ready because we might be going into Iraq soon. And and we were all just like, what? What are we talking about? We we still got (laughs) Afghanistan. Yeah. You know that story. But yeah. So, yeah, we were still doing OSW missions, DC alert, and then uh, um, OEF missions. So a year later, do you deploy back for the Iraq show? No, I... I got a, an assignment to Saudi Arabia to teach the Saudis how to fly the F-15E. So they, they have a Strike Eagle version. So I, it was yeah. my assignment. I was up, I was due to move. It had been three years in the squadron. So I got an assignment to Saudi Arabia. We had an exchange program with them. Mm-hmm. And uh, I went and taught in their uh, RTU, FTU formal training unit and taught new pilots and whistles how to fly the F-15E, which uh, it turned out to be a, a really a good assignment, but it was interesting, you know, so during OIF, when that kicked off, we were told to stay home, stay in your compound, don't fly. I mean, the airspace is pretty much turned over to you guys. And yeah. so we were down in Kamis, down on the Southwest portion of Saudi Arabia. So we were out of the fight and we didn't fly for a couple of weeks. We just kind of watched the, uh, the war mm-hmm. unfold on TV, which was pretty interesting. But I understand Kamis is really a cool base. A good friend of mine flew 117s during the first Gulf War out of there. And he says, it, yeah, it's, it's really it's an interesting a, place. Yeah, they still have the F-117 shelters that they use for F-18s. Um, it's up at six or 7,000 feet. So the climate is really comfortable. You know, when, when it's mm-hmm. June or July in Riyadh and the temperatures are 130, it's 90, 95. And so clean mountain air, it was actually, uh, the climate was pretty nice. Talk to us about, here you are training one of our international partners. And what was that like? And maybe relate some of your lessons learned from being this very experienced Wizzo now flying with an international partner. Yep. Um, they were very inquisitive because they knew we had experience fighting in Afghanistan. It had been a while. I mean, the Strike Eagle 
they knew we had experience in Allied Force, um, some in Desert Storm. But for me personally, uh, I had recent experience in Afghanistan. So the squadron commander was quite excited to have me in the squadron to help teach his up and coming pilots mm-hmm. and whizzos how to employ the F-15. And so I had a greater sense of urgency to teach these guys. They you were like, we're not going to go to war with anybody. And now, you know, a decade later, they're dealing with the Yemeni and the Houthis. Yeah. Did. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so. And they're like the main the, base. Yeah, <laughs> it, it was. Uh, I think they were appreciative of our experience and the folks that were there to help teach them. Hey, these guys are recently been in combat. You students, you know, the squadron commander talking to students, like, you better pay attention to what they, they have because they, they've been there and done that. Yeah, it was it was a good time to be there. I talk about a three star general in my book that I had a lot of interaction with. I wish I could find his contact information now. He's one of those guys that nobody knows about, was a member of the royal family and was our Saudi liaison up there. Just absolutely a wonderful, wonderful guy. And I'm so appreciative that I got to develop that kind of relationship with him. And and uh, our Saudi partners are great people to work for and with. And <laughs> I can't say enough about this particular Lieutenant General. I'm not going to say his name. I think now he's like the head of their FAA or something like that in Saudi Arabia. I think okay. that's what he's doing now all of our Saudi partners, I really enjoyed spending time with them and talking to them. The tanker guys were always coming to me, particularly since they knew I had developed our weapons school and they're always going, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about this? They were very, very eager to learn. So when you leave Saudi Arabia, where do you go to next? Uh, off to Lake and East uh, for my next ops assignment. And I uh, got to fly in the 494th fighter squadron at Lake and Heath. did about three years uh, with that squadron. And then uh, off to, I, I went back to Seymour Johnson and taught at the FTU there. So uh-huh. I did that for about a year off and then or for a year and a half and then went off to school and went to Army. I asked to go to Army Command and General Staff College because of my experience in, uh, mm-hmm. in Afghanistan. Because I'll be honest with you, when the, when the ground, the glow stands up, the Army guy in your squadron stands up and, and shows you a bunch of symbols on a map. I didn't have a clue what any, any of those squares <laughs> meant. And so I had asked, you know, my number one school I wanted to go to was the Army Command and Staff College because our airplane, our primary mission is to help support the guys on the ground. So um, that became my focus, you know, for the next 10 years of my life. So I, I did Army Command and General Staff College. I asked to stay for an extra year and thankfully and luckily got into uh, the School of Advanced Military Studies, SAMS. And so I spent two years at Fort Leavenworth. Mm-hmm. Um, with a number of joint partners, but embedding myself. And, and that's where I met El Cid. Uh, Sue Campbell was in my class there, you know, oh, so yeah. we got a, and we took an elective called Operation Anaconda at, at Army Command and General Staff College. So we got to brief, you know, the instructors like, you guys were there? Oh my God. And so we, you know, and so we had, his wife was there in the class as well, uh, KC. So it was really uh, cool to be in that class and firsthand experience with El Cid down the hallway, you know, who was, as the deputy group commander there. Yeah. So, yeah. It was good. I'm really happy. I went to that school um, and got to integrate with the army. Oh, I'll bet. And they were probably happy to have you there because of your background and supporting the things yep. that you were doing. So, so you were at the chaos in Osan during a very interesting time period where. Yeah, I did. I, and when I wasn't flying the F-15E, I did a lot of chaos work. I, my first one was after Sam's at army. I went to uh I went to uh, the CAC at IUD. I spent a year in the strategy division in 2010, 2011, and that was drawdown of Iraq and also first voting in Afghanistan. And plus, we're figuring out what to do with the country in between Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. Um, just not sure what they're, what's on their agenda. That was my first year introduction to working in the CAC and, and that machine running and, and really enjoyed that year. I, I, I probably grew more as a officer, a joint officer in that assignment. Absolutely. Than, anything out and then i ended up going to another aoc out at uh in hawaii the 613th aoc working at, at PACAF headquarters and i uh, got a chance to run the strategy division out there but yeah my last assignment in the air force i commanded the 607th air operations center in korea north korea was very busy the, the last few years i was there a lot mm-hmm. of saber rattling a lot of missile testing of some you know he, he's expanding some of his capabilities mm-hmm. and some of the ballistic missiles he has so it'll certainly keep us on our toes so I uh, got to work with some great, great airmen, uh, great bosses out there. And uh, it was just a fantastic way to kind of end my Air Force career, being on the side of folks that send people to war. Now the guys mm-hmm. that send out the ATO to kind of give back because it's hard work. Yeah. Working in the chaos is 
it's not very sexy work. It's really interesting. It's really cool. But everybody wants to be on the point end. Everybody wants to be in the cockpit. Again, for the guys that fly, we want to be out on the line flying. Mm-hmm. But to me, the next best place is at least be, in plan- be a planner in the wars, orchestrating it and making it happen. And so I just said it was just an amazing uh, way to go out. The next best thing to fly on. My time in the chaos, people ask me about that during the during Anaconda and going into Iraq. So I was there during two really intense time periods. And the thing that I enjoyed the most, how are we going to do this with a deck of cards we have? And the puzzle was always different, different resources. You had to deal with the allied partners. Will you, will you let us come in and and park airplanes on your ramp? Will you not let us, will you give us, that was an extremely rewarding thing for me during Iraqi freedom because I had such an incredible team working with me. Fortunately, I got to pick. And because we were at the maximum of effectiveness and efficiency, effectiveness and efficiency in the tankers. We didn't have any air spares. We didn't have any ground alerts. All we had was airplanes that were flying. And every day it was something different. That's the one thing I remember. Every day it was a different puzzle and we worked it. And we were successful at it. And I think that kind of explains where you're at too, where here we have a North Korean missile shot this day. Next day, it's maybe humanitarian somewhere. Some humanitarian supplies. I mean, it was just every day it was different. And that's the challenge I loved being put in a place where you are working on a very, very complex puzzle and you do it. And you got to work for a great boss, Cruiser Wilsbach. I did. Yeah. What a, what a outstanding American. And now he's running uh pack half, but he is, he is a warrior at heart, but also a caring, caring yeah. leader, charismatic leader, incredibly smart. And uh, I really, I learned a lot from general Wilsbach for sure. What, what a, uh, My what a last leader. ride in an F-15 was with him in the front seat. Is that right? As captains. At Kadena or uh... at Kadena, at Kadena, 1994. Somewhere around there. (laughs) My last ride was with Cruiser in the front seat. I'll send you the picture. We're coming up to the tanker and you can see his head and he's adjusting his mirrors. And I I learned a new term called stagger back. Yes. (laughs) 8.2 G's. 8.2 G's. I saw uh, about four. six inches of the back of his seat. <laughs> and then he has the audacity to say, you still with me, Sluggo? My eyes are starting to open back up and everything finally, you know. He just went right into it, too. Hang on, Sluggo. Boom, right to 8.2. Tanker guys don't do this regularly. <laughs> I, I call that Wizzo appreciation. <laughs> more than once in my time frame where I'm looking left thinking the guy's going to go by my pilot's going to go left and he cranks right at turn and my head smacks the side of the canopy and uh, there was no warning, but uh, that's good. I'm actually glad you got to experience that. Yeah. <laughs> my yeah. No, that's, that's great. You got to get one to get to fly in a, in a D model, but also get to fly. With yeah. I got a, I got three rides while I was there. One with a very dear friend of mine from BYU, one from the weapons officer, the 67th. And then my last ride was with cruiser when he was in the bats, he was the weapons officer in the bats. I'll never forget that. Hang on, awesome. Sluggo, right to 8.2. You know, in my mind, my eyeballs went right to the G meter when he said that. I didn't go anywhere else. I went right to the G meter and I saw it go like 8.2. And I'm like going, oh, oh, trying to stay awake. And he pulls out, are you with me? Are you with me? Well, yeah, I'm waking up. I'm waking up. Wizzo appreciates. When I was at Oson, and I was lucky enough to get a couple rides in the F-15, F-16D model at Oson. And I hadn't pulled G's, you know, and five, six years. And I had that same F-16 uh, can pull a lot of G's and our, our first yeah. GX, just a G warm up, five to seven G's. It was like I was pulling G's for the first time. <laughs> oh, man, my G tolerance is so low right now. You build up wow. tolerance after a while, but yeah, if you haven't done it in a while, man, it, it can catch you off. Guard yeah, for it sure. can. Well, brother, anything else to share with us? Any other lesson learned? This has been no, great because so really you've told us things that none of us have heard about. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we, we hit it, uh, hit all the highlights. I mean, it, it's, yeah, it's unfortunate that that incident happened. However, you know, I fall back on all the instructors that took the time to teach us how to employ weapons in every squeeze in every minute, every ounce we could out of every training sortie. Cause you just never know when you're going to get the call on all those TDYs from red flags to air to ground, WESIP, 
all those add up to uh, more experience. Getting out and picking the brains of, of guys in your squadron who have been there and done that is incredibly valuable. And, and it's yeah, I've, I've listened to your podcast and all, all the guys in your podcast talk about, you know, a lot of good lessons of picking your brains, either hanging out at the bar, being yeah. in the vault, you know, in the backyard with your neighbor who flies in your squadron, just asking them questions about how to do stuff. And, hey, have you seen this? And just learning all those things, you just kind of pack away and they emerge, you know, when you need them. Yeah. And you'll never know when they need them. You'll never know when you need that. Like, uh, you know, pig talked about pig Fleischman talked about in the F 16, all of a sudden, boom, I know how to put my L 39 down on its flaps. Now Uh, just, that's crazy stuff, but yeah, Mm -hmm. perfect stuff. Thanks for coming on, man. This has been great. Been great to have you on and, and telling this particular story and the things that you had to go through and the emotions that you felt in such a momentous battle that can you believe it's been 20 years? I can't No, Cause I still have good memories. I cannot believe it's been 20 years. So my, how time flies, but I really yeah. appreciate you being on the show. It was, it was a pleasure to talk to you and uh, enjoyed uh, telling a little bit about uh, what happened 20 years ago on a mountaintop in Afghanistan. Thanks again, brother, for being on. All right. Take care, Sluggo. Good talking to you. Okay, folks, I'm going to take you into battle here for a few minutes. Spliff Russell was kind enough to send me his video that has the audio to it. And I want you to listen to what's going on. They've already made one pass and the guys on the ground have told him, no, I need you to swing it around a little bit. And you have to remember, during this whole time period, Slick Zero One, Sergeant Vance and Gabe Brown on the ground are getting shot at from several directions by all of these Al-Qaeda And listen how calm their voices are. You can hear Twister 5-1 and 5-2 are trying to get their bearings. They just showed up. They're just trying to figure out what's going on. They've already made one pass and realized, wait a minute, we got to move it. So listen to the voices and listen to all the confusion and extra chatter that's going on behind the scene on the radio. And of course, Slick01 saying, kill that target. Staff Sergeant Gabe Brown continues to call in fire from Twister 5-1 and 5-2. This clip that you're going to hear is him calling them to come back, telling them how to do it, and he says, danger close, and he gives his initials saying, I take responsibility for where your bullets are going to land. And remember, he just got off of a helicopter that has four people dead in it already. A door gunner and three of the 75th Ranger Battalion folks that he flew up there on. He's calling in firepower to put the hurt on Al-Qaeda on this mountain. Make restricted attack heading 220 and reciprocal. And uh, keep them coming, keep them coming. With their danger close, 75 meters, go problem. Good morning. Two, two, two. Is the last pass good heading or not? Yes. I want you to light that damn tree up off the nose of the halo. Jaguar 1-2. In this clip, you're going to hear Twister 5-1 rolling in. You're actually going to hear the gun go. And Twister 5-2 with Chris Russell in it has to leave because they're out of gas. But now one of the frustrating parts is about to happen where... The Predator is coming in, slow moving, takes a while for it to set up and everything. While they're going to the tanker, these guys are still under fire. They're still being shot at on the ground. Mako 30 and the quick reaction force that have Gabe Brown and Kevin Vance in it. One heads up, there's a Predator uh, on final. Copy. Five one, Twister five one's in heading two two zero. Friendly helicopter in sight. Friendly clear hot. Don't put your bullets over the ridge. Five thousand. Who's gonna go in over to a tanker? Hey, those bullets are right on. They're right on. So did 
did you hear Gabe Brown right there at the end? Hey, those bullets are right on, right on. They're strafing these trees with 20 millimeter bullets. They're shooting like 180 to 200 bullets in that brrr that you heard. And he's telling them, they're right on, they're right on. Because he's looking up the mountain and he sees the trees exploding and he can smell the pine from the trees as they're hitting them. Again, he's only 80 meters away from this position, this bunker and this clump of trees on top of the mountain, Tackergar Mountain. The other crazy thing about this is Neil Roberts, the seal, his body is up there leaning against a tree near this massive rock, which you can see in the video. You can also see the downed Chinook helicopter, Razor One, in Spliff's video and Twister 5-1's video. But another Medal of Honor winner is in one of those bunkers, dead. They don't know that. Tech Sergeant John Chapman, Air Force Combat Controller, is in one of those bunkers amongst the trees. This is part of the confusion and the fog of war. You may not know where everybody is. They know where Gabe Brown is. He's 80 meters down on this side of the of the mountain that they're shooting at. And he keeps telling them, shoot right off the nose, shoot right off the nose. I want to bullets in that clump of trees because that's where the Al-Qaeda fighters and the Taliban fighters are all located. Now, remember a couple of weeks ago that Pig Fleischman, when we interviewed him, he said, gas is your hourglass. And now you hear Twister 5-1 and 5-2. They're both out of gas. They have to leave. And Gabe Brown is asking him, okay, who's showing up next? Who's showing up next? We're not done here. We're not done here yet. And he doesn't know. But in fact, they're already working two F-16s, Class 7-1, Class 7-2, are about to be told to come over there and help out in this situation. They both expend all the rounds in their F-16 guns because they've shot the gun at ground targets. That's what F-16s do. And they've worked in tro with troops in contact, so they know how to drop their bombs and do all that kind of stuff. They're, they have training for what they're about to get involved with that Chris Russell and his pilot, Panzer, and the Pilot and Wizzo and Twister 5-1 did not in the F-15E community. It doesn't matter because when your buddies are in trouble on the ground, you do everything you can to help save their lives. Even if it means doing something you've never trained for because we will leave no one behind. Uh, uh, we have to proceed to the tanker. Hey. I'm going to end the episode right here. This is a good spot. I hope you can gather a sense of listening to Spliff and listening to the actual audio from the mission. The professionalism, the dedication to those we don't know, have never met before, but they're on the ground and they need our help. I put the tanker anchor areas to refuel only about five minutes away from where they're fighting this fight. And I remember in a phone call with Chris, he says, man, that was so huge to us because we could just run back and forth to the tanker. We didn't have to leave the area that we were supporting. We didn't have to leave the troops in contact because the tankers were so close. One other thing. It still makes me emotional. I watched those guys coming out of the back of Razor One, the helicopter, with Captain Nate Self and his quick reaction force to go up there to rescue these guys, going into this fight, not knowing all of the things that were happening on top of that mountain. And it still puts a lump in my throat and sometimes even tears in my eyes as I listen to that. Folks, I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Lessons from the Cockpit with Colonel Chris Spliff Russell, weapon system officer extraordinaire and a true patriot. This episode was sponsored by Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit, a book that's found in all four formats on Amazon. It's in hardback, softback, Kindle, and Audible. The electronic versions have an extra file with the 32 pictures that you can download with it. 
On next week's show, I have on the chief boom operator from the 909th Air Refueling Squadron when I was assigned there, Chief Dan Jones. And he's going to give us kind of a perspective from the enlisted troops, which is going to be really great and fascinating. He has three generations of his family that are boom operators. Himself, his son, and his grandson have all been boom operators in the Air Force. So this is going to be something to really look forward to. Thanks for listening to our show. Go to my website, marcasera.com, for previous episodes of the show. And we look forward to talking to you next week.